Right. So now you see why look, this stand up comedy. So now you see why I got the first discussion first, how to launch your album. I knew it's gonna be a lot of people, and then it's about a more theoretical but very interesting topic. Everybody would go, I knew that. So it's I think it, it would gonna work. So now we're gonna have Ron who will talk about social influence. His I don't know, I chased him a lot so he can come here and, and talk. Before that, I would like to thank um, Andre. The previous talks were, were held, well, facilitated by the World Foundation, which is around Victoria Tube Station. And they, they very kind, you know, and they help us with everything, facilitate the, the event. And he's our sponsor. So, talking about SMEs, about small, medium enterprises, if you're interested in this, um, two minutes for, for Andre to explain what they do. So you might be interested in attending their seminars or anything else. So. Cool. Thanks, Tommy, for that. One, two. Thank you, everyone. It's going to take two minutes. I'm not going to talk for very long because I know you want to get to this gentleman here with some great information. Um, as a great talk by Jesse, there was um, a couple of points I took away from it, which was around really starting to think of yourselves not just as artists in this new age digital technology, we have to think of ourselves as businesses, small businesses, medium businesses, and want to grow to larger businesses. So we've got to really have a vision of ourselves as more than just the artist. And if there's a team around us to help us do that, then so be it. If we're doing it ourselves, that's fine too. We do have to start thinking like this. So I'm going to talk to you quickly about an organisation I work for. Um, it's called London Fusion. And London Fusion is a, it's a partnership between four universities across London. And what we do is we offer business support and development to small and medium enterprises in the creative and digital industries. So it's funded by the European Union. So we've been given a £5 million to spend with small businesses in London and really offering them a series of assistance as I said, to help them get some growth. And it's all fully funded, so it's free for the businesses in London who are in the creative and digital sector. So what we do is we help companies to um, identify new opportunities. We help you to collaborate with other companies, which I think is really important. And that came up a lot in Jesse's talk, this idea that people in the music industry could collaborate on projects. I mean, I just had an interesting conversation with young, one young lady who's travelling from Newcastle to Gig, not getting paid well by promoters, sometimes getting ripped off, not getting expenses met. Collaboration between four different musicians or bands could then go on and put their own show. Why not? For that cost of travelling and setting up and doing lots of investment to do a gig for someone else, you could run your own venue by collaborating. So it's this idea of collaboration we're really in favour of and trying to get people together with others who can help them. So as I said, it's for London-based SMEs. SMEs are small, medium enterprises, so basically it could be a one-man band up to someone turning over 40 million pounds, so it's quite a wide, wide berth of companies that we'll talk to, or businesses we'll talk to. Um, got to work in the creative or digital sector, have to be ambitious and looking to grow, and a desire to expand what they're doing. And so those are our criteria there. Um, Run through them. And what we'll offer you is um, basically it's, it's very particular to each person what you need. So we try to offer a tailored service. So the first thing we'll do is sit down with you and look at what your goals are, look at where you want to grow to, what you want to achieve. And then we'll try and put in resources from our partners and help you achieve that. So it'll be stuff that can help you grow. It might be about giving you information or access to information or expertise that can help you achieve some of your goals. And um, here's some of the things we do. So we have a collaboration award where you can work together with other companies, get access to up to £10,000 in funding to work on a project. Uh, we've got, we can put a PhD student in your, in your organisation for six months to maybe do some of those tasks you're not equipped to do. Um, we offer things like business model workshops so you can sit down and work out what's my model for growing, growing our, our activities, whether it's as a band, Music making entity, how you want to define yourself. 
you do need a plan, you need a model to do that or a roadmap. So we can help you put that sort of thing together as well. And these are the partners. We work at um, Lancaster University Management School, that's who I work for. Um, also Queen Mary University, which is in East London, if some of you are familiar with that. We've got the Royal College of Art and C4CC, which is the University of London. These are how many businesses we're going to be working with over the next two years. So a thousand, we want to meet a thousand, over a thousand companies. And we want to work closely around 500 and then work extremely closely to help them create something new with 120. So these are the numbers we're looking at over the next two years, a year and a half in the next six months. And we've got stuff like talks and events, um, events like this around different subjects. Um, I said we've been working with Tommy for a while and dark music talks to deliver a lot of these in our office in St. James's Park. Um, we can give you access to experts to talk about different trends, it could be around technology, could be around social networking, digital delivery, whatever it is you need. And also we provide events for you to network and collaborate with people who can help you. So maybe you need someone who develops apps. Where do you meet them? Maybe you need to do a, some sort of collaboration with them. One hand scratches the other, you do something for them, they do something for you, and you move forward together. So we try to encourage those sort of relationships as well. And as in masterclasses, we'll help you identify new opportunities, and we'll also um, offer advice and support if you want to develop a business plan, or a marketing strategy, or anything like that. We can sit down and help you do that too. So, I'm going to draw this to a close now. Your next steps. My colleague over there, Norm, give you a wave, you can either talk to her or talk to me at the end of this, and um, we can give you some advice or some information about how to get in touch with us and take things forward. Or just tell you more about London Fusion and how it can help you. And so I'll cut that short now and move on to our speaker. Thank you. Great. So we're going to start the next discussion. Again, this will be more theoretical. So any questions, any, will be more like an oval to you know, it's not a normal discussion that we do, we'll do with everybody. You will not talk with, about releasing your album, you know, with your friends, you will do that. But you will not talk about social influence. So I think there is a lot of knowledge to take out of this presentation. And feel free to participate. Ron. Hey. Uh, that's really distracting, by the way. So if you see me looking over that way, uh, I should be back this way. Uh, my name is Ron, and I'll talk a little about influence. Uh, the actual great part is that a lot of the questions at the end of Jesse's uh, session uh, play into a lot of what I'm going to talk about here about how, how you reach people, how you get people engaged with you, uh, and, and all that great stuff. So, uh, Tommy asked me to remind you what if you're going to tweet to use the hashtag. Dark Music Docs, and if you're going to talk about me, make sure you use my full name, Ron Schott, uh, not R Schott, because R Schott gets really mad at when people tweet him about social and stuff like that. Sorry. He's a, uh, he's a geologist and very famous, and I'm not famous, <laughs> and, and I don't know anything about rocks. I know about rock, but uh, not rocks. So, yeah, definite uh, kind of overlap there. Uh, this is me. I, I'm from Seattle. I, I moved here eight months ago now. Um, and I get the big opportunity to work with a lot of awesome brands here in the UK. Uh, sadly, moving here took me away from working uh, with a lot of the, the people I like to work with in the United States. Uh, uh, this is this big music and arts uh, event called Bumper Shoot in Seattle, which is a really, really huge event. And I get to work with a lot of great artists and stuff there. Uh, and it also took me away from working with all my friends who are musicians and who uh, actually do play shows or, or gigs here as you call them, I still haven't got, haven't got that yet. But, uh, you know, I, I got the chance to come here and I'm really happy to talk to you guys about uh, social and about influence. So really what is influence? Influence is this idea that you know, people have the capacity or power to change people's minds or to influence their actions, influence what they do, influence what they talk about, influence what they buy, that sort of stuff. And uh, in my job in the advertising industry, I, I, I talk about this in terms of people buying products, or people changing behavior, or people talking about a brand in a certain way. Uh, you know, but, but influence is, is really about everything you do in your life. Um, 
as much as we like to think we're all individuals all the time, there's someone who is influencing us in some way that then creates this sort of idea of an individual uh, that, we, that we create. And then in the digital space, which is what I, I really focus on, you know, this is, it's really the same thing. Um, it's, influence really just kind of came of age when the digital age really started. But if you really think about it, um, all the way back to the time of the Roman times, or even when people were just starting to come together in villages, um, people were actually influencing each other all the time. Because when you went to the store and you didn't know it, or we went to the market, so I don't know stores, when we went to the market, you were going to buy the best goat uh, there was there. You were going to buy the best carrots that there were in the market. How would you really know who had the best carrots? It was all about influence and what people were telling you. Uh, what you kind of perceive to be the truth. And so what we have now is this idea that in the digital age, it's, it's just kind of changed. We're, we're still having the same conversations. We're still talking uh, with people about our interests and about our wants, our needs, and people are, are helping us down that line. And in, in the digital space, it's breaking down these three things. Relevance, reach, and resonance. So how closely is someone actually tied to a subject, uh, whether that is your type of music, or whether that is music in, in general, or whether that's someone who may work in a label and they're, they're in charge of the or something like that. How closely are they tied to this idea? Reach is how many people actually listen to this person. In the digital space, it's allowed us to actually increase our reach exponentially. You know, they forget that about before the internet started, normal people had a general circle of influence of about 10 to 20 people. These are your family, your close coworkers. Uh, people you may know, it's just, just me. But now, in, in this digital age, where they say people actually have normal Facebook users has over 200 friends. Most of them don't know half of them, but they still have these 200 friends. They're seeing stuff they're talking about. Throw Twitter in there, it's another 200 followers. People all of a sudden have this reach of 400, 500, 600 people, and that's just for a normal user. Uh, but when you're talking about people who are maybe influential, uh, you, know, you start to see that number grow even more. So we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of people in some cases. And then resonance, that's something that we use uh, in our measurements to actually measure how effective someone is at, at affecting change. Um, in the digital space, you look at that as something like, let's say someone tells me about a product or about a new band, I tweet out a link to their new YouTube video. How many people are actually looking at off of, off of my tweet? So how many people are seeing what I say, saying that, okay, that wrong guy actually maybe knows what he's talking about, we're gonna go and look at it. Um, and so that's how we measure resonance in the digital space. Like I said, the, this idea of influence, is, it's been evolving over time, um, all, the, all the way back from the markets. But, you know, over the past couple of years, it's, or a couple decades, sorry, it's actually changed. In, in the internet age, in the 90s, when we were all signing onto the internet, using Yahoo Messenger and all that great stuff for the first time, using uh, Google when it, when it came about, and, and all this idea about how we find information, uh, just that access was key. And, and back then it was simply having access to this wider world that gave us the, the power to actually influence people. As the social web came along, uh, all of a sudden we were connected to more people, not just information. We had the ability to reach out, the ability to share, the ability to kind of pick and choose what was actually coming into our life in terms of information, and then pick and choose what we're gonna share out as well. And now, over the past couple of years, there's this idea of real time and how that's evolving. We have the ability to, you know, as I, I, was, as I was sitting in the back, I was looking at the hashtag uh, that people were using uh, during Jesse's talk and seeing what people were saying about that. We're able to dive into these conversations in real time, and that gives us not only resonance, or sorry, relevancy, but also gives us context, right? We're there, we're in the moment, we're able to talk to people. Also, sorry, if you have any questions as I'm going along, if I say some kind of industry jargon or something, throw your hand up in the air, throw something at me, and uh, I'll go back and answer your question. And this, this whole idea about influence is really based on the fact that people are definitely more connected, they're more mobile, and they're more open. In the UK alone, 37% of people in the country are actually using mobile social. So that's not only just using their phone to check a place on Google or using their phone to text their friends, they're actually using their phone and having conversations. Uh, that's really important when you think about the fact that you're out at a gig, your friends are out at a gig, and they see this brand new artist, and 
I'll send it, they're just blown away. And they, they share that information with their friends on Twitter, they share uh, Instagram video of those people up there actually singing or, or playing their guitar, banging, and banging a shovel against the floor, I don't know. And um, all of a sudden, this, this becomes something that's shareable, and that's something that's really exciting to us. Uh, in the industry, it's really exciting to me personally, and it's really scary to a lot of people as well, right? Because all of a sudden, you, I, you can be able to say, you can meet me, and I can drop this microphone at any second of time. Someone snaps a picture of it, all of a sudden it's out on the web. Stupid American guy drops a microphone at Barbican, people laugh him off stage. Um, you know, and, and it is scary, but at the same time, it's really empowering. Um, because when you think about the fact that maybe someone out in this crowd, or maybe someone at the next crowd at your next gig, could be that person that knows the right person, that knows the other right person, that gets your foot in the door, it becomes really exciting. But how does this actually apply to you guys? Um, it's this idea about the, the, the fact that we have this, this great connected culture now. Um, we also have a lot of noise out there. Um, but when you're up on stage or when someone's actually listening to your music, maybe through your website, it's not the only thing going on in their life. And we can thank those same devices that let us share stuff for that, right? Uh, we've all been at a gig and seen people next to you standing there just on their phone the whole time. Or uh, you're talking with someone, they pull their phone out of their pocket. My wife gets mad at me all the time. Um, but being able to like cut through this noise is actually uh, a pretty hard thing to do. Especially when there are 400 million tweets a day just out of the UK alone, and they're not all just about food anymore. Um, but, the, but then when you think through that noise, there are these people who are making decisions, these people who are tastemakers, and that's really what we're uh, going to talk about how we find them. This is what I call the typical influence pyramid. You've got these people who are your, your, your top tier influencers, your columnists, people who write for Pitchfork. Some guy that somehow weaseled his way into a column with the Daily Mail or something like that. And these people feel that they have the right to tell you what's music, what's good, what's not good, all that stuff. Um, and then you have the mid-tier. These are these kind of empowered bloggers, right? These are these guys who are, they're kind of up and coming. Um, they may be local to either neighborhood or local to city, but they're, but they're really out there. They really are a part of the scene. They're really liking the music. They're really into artists. And, and then they're starting to get a good following. And then you have this bottom tier, these people who are really excited, really passionate. These are the people that like, you may have only been around for maybe three weeks, but these people are showing up at every single gig that you've had over those three weeks in your friend's backyard because they love your music, um, their friends love their music, they're telling everyone about this. And these are the people that, that we really want to reach out to. You know, but typically, even in the business world, you're talking about this idea of, uh, you know, people aren't gonna focus uh, on that mid-tier uh, they're usually focusing on these other areas that I'm crossing out here. And that's because, in a lot of cases, and even in the advertising world now, we're flipping this model on, on its head. And it's because we're finding out that these people who are more passionate, more connected, and more connected to you as artists, whether it's your friends, whether it's your friends or friends, these are the people who are going to be sharing your content. We were talking earlier about how you keep people engaged, how you interact with people online. And, and this is really where it all starts. It starts with reaching out to your fan base and reaching out to your friends. You're not really going to have access to, the, to these top level bloggers or anything like that as, as an emerging artist. If you're part of a label, yeah, sure. You're going to have PR people who will be out there and they'll be pitching your story and they'll be, they'll be doing all this stuff for you. But as an artist yourself, you have to think of yourself as a small business. And, and because of that, you're really your you're PR person, you're your business person, you're everyone. Uh, this, sorry, this, just a quick story here. This actual photo is. Uh, a poster out of Facebook uh, in Menlo Park, and it's something that they have up in their office. And as weird as I think Facebook is, and as crazy of a place it is, they actually have some really inspiring things in their office. And um, this is just something I look at every morning, actually, to help me kind of think about what, why I do what I do. And uh, so this, this next section really just talks about how, how do you find these people. Uh, that was kind of kind of led off the conversation last time. Um, but the first thing really is, is finding your voice. On social, you know who you are as an artist, you know who you are as a person. Um, the biggest thing that I see from a lot of people is that all of a sudden they come and they feel like, okay, this is going to be my presence. Uh, I have a friend who runs a, uh, runs a very small label in Seattle called Debacle Records, and he's also in a group called The Megabats. And he's one of the funniest um, 
people I've ever met in my entire life. And you see that through him at work, you see that through him when he's on stage, you see that through him when he is uh, working with people that are disabled, and you see it uh, through a, basically when he's talking with his friends. He's this person in every single aspect of what he does, and that also comes through through his social media. So if you look at their Twitter feed for their band or for his record label, uh, you, you can see it's him, you can tell it's his heart and soul in it. And when people are able to connect to a person rather than just this kind of ephemeral idea of a group or idea of a brand or product or anything like that, people are able to actually make a better connection with that. And they're more likely to share that information. They're more likely to be involved with it. And because of that, you know, we really see that this idea of having a presence you know, it was a really good idea, but only if you have a purpose for your presence. So yeah, it's great to go out there, create your Twitter page, create your Facebook profile, uh, you know, snag Instagram while you're at it, uh, YouTube, this is just kind of a list. And you know, if you want to use this list as your checklist, that's great. Um, but you want to be in these places, mostly because if someone does see you out at a gig and, you know, they, they don't have a friend to turn to and ask, you know, what group is that, or, or, or where can I find out more about these people, you want to actually be able to be found. Um, and these days that involves coming up in Google. Uh, so yeah, having a presence on all these pages, it's not saying you have to put a ton of content out there, but if you're able to at least set up these profiles, have a link that goes back to somewhere where you actually can update your information a lot more, um, that should do you some good as well. And MySpace really is still really showing up uh, highly in search, so it's kind of interesting actually. And it, it, it worked for this guy. I, he just Bieber with compassion, but um, you know, he really, <laughs> if you think about it, especially in North America, this guy, this kid at this point in time, had a YouTube page, sang a bunch of songs, and all of a sudden became this. Um, so you know, maybe, maybe that means that social media isn't always good, it kind of enabled this to happen, but it, it, it's this real story of this little tiny kid who had a major set of pipes and a uh, and weird pants now. But uh, yeah, and that, uh, that was all really open, open social media. The second part is actually listening. Um, one of the things that I really got my friends in Seattle doing after their gigs was going on Twitter, uh, putting in the name of their band, and just seeing who was talking about them after that gig. Uh, it's really easy to do, and you know, maybe it's five people, maybe it's 20 people, maybe it's 100 people. But if you're able to better connect with someone that really connected with you as, a, as an artist, after that experience, it, it's really interesting, actually. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, but you can also find out, you know, stuff about maybe the venues that you play in a lot, put the venue uh, in a search, see what people are saying about the different bands that played there, see what people are saying about the artists, kind of get a feel for what kind of people go there, that sort of thing. And that, that's seriously really easy to do, and, uh, you know, it's not incredibly vain to Google yourself or Google your group, all the time, it's actually something that, uh, that most people do, yeah. Sorry, hey, uh, there's something called Google Alerts, which you can set up, I don't know if people know about this. Uh, Google Alerts, and then you just put in a keyword and you'll get an email every day uh, telling you, so you can put in uh, your band name, and then whenever anyone mentions it anywhere online, you'll get an email. Totally. Yeah, so I mean, you can do the same thing. You can uh, do it on Google Alerts, you get your email every day. Uh, a lot of times that takes a couple days to pull stuff in, but you know, like, like I said, my buddies are really, they get really jacked up after, after a gig. They be like, man, that was awesome. The crowd really loved this night. They go online and, and try to find these people, who, usually 15 year old girls who like them because they were, that was their demo. But yeah, they, and, and then they were able to actually talk to these people and have those conversations. But yeah, like pulling stuff in through Google Alerts as well. Uh, Instagram, as, as people are like using more and more video and using photos as well, it's a great great place to find people, uh, especially for your demo, might be a little bit younger. And then YouTube as well, people are taking video, that scary, scary video of you, but you know, really just use what's available out there. There, there are tons of paid products and people will try to get you to pay for some sort of monitoring service or something like that. And a lot of time, honestly, you can do a better job yourself because you know your fans, you know what they're talking about, and you, and you know uh, you as a, as a person. The second part on this has nothing to do with alpacas, other than they will start with A, is act. And that's, that's not engaging with your fans. Like I said, after, after the gig, go out there and talk with people face to face, but then when you have a chance to talk in the digital space, do that as well. 
it, it's really an extension and, and it can take you a lot further. Um, there's an artist who came out of Seattle called Macklemore, he's kind of big now, um, but luckily I, I don't want to be too much of a hipster, but I got to see him back when he was playing gigs with like 20 people in the basement of a club in Seattle. And the guy was the same person back then that he is now, which is actually incredible if you think about it. But this guy still to this day will talk to people on Twitter after shows, talk to people during the day, um, just reach out to people, connect with people, and all of a sudden you start getting these people in your corner, and, and that becomes really important. Um, if you actually see it, it's on this next one. Yeah, so talking about giving people that look inside. I think, uh, I think it was you actually was talking about sharing different pieces of your life. Um, not necessarily uh, just your music, right? It was sharing, like fishing, um, sharing that sort of stuff. And then, and then you as well with your, uh, your images, with the song lyrics, and you would just post that stuff as well. You know, this is that stuff that is, it's you as an artist, it's, it's, it's you as a person, and when you start putting those two things together, it starts engaging people a lot more. So giving people that look behind the scenes uh, becomes really important. Uh, again, I don't, I don't want to stack this with Seattle artists, but uh, Macklemore did shoot a video in Seattle a couple weeks ago, um, and they used a very, very small account, this broadcast coffee account, which is a friend of a friend of a friend, sent this tweet out, told people, hey, something's, something's going on up on Capitol Hill, which is the area of Seattle, they're going to shoot a video. And then all of a sudden, literally that night, they had to turn people away off the street. This is a gigantic street. And then turn people away. Then over 40,000 people show up just to have their hands be in this music video. Um, pretty incredible, but it just kind of shows that you can use your influence, you can use the influence of your fans to really push people along. And, that, and that's all about just sharing something with them that everyone likes to be first to know something. So being able to just give someone the idea that maybe they're getting to see something behind the scenes, or maybe they're getting to see something before somebody else. Uh, is a real kind of motivator in the, in the space of the day for the world. Last thing is have fun. Um, you know, may, I'm guessing you probably don't create music because you want to be rich, but you know, that's, we're all going to be rich someday, right? We hope. But uh, you know, just have, have fun with what you do. Have fun with your fans. And, and don't, if you start treating it like it's something you have to just kind of check every day, you're going to start doing it less and less, and you're going to start doing it with less enthusiasm. But if you think, um, when you go out there and you're looking for your influencers online, you're looking for your fans online, you're interacting with them, if you think that is the same exact thing as walking off stage after a gig and shaking someone's hand, or walking off stage after a gig and thanking someone for showing up at your show, that's where like you start to come out. And that's where you start to have these connections. Um, I've just got one more thing, and I, I, I'm gonna apologize for this right away, but it's, screw the haters, man. Like, if you can't, if you can't get past that, <laughs> you're gonna have a really hard time. Uh, I, I can say I, I have not played in a band live in probably ten years, um, and a lot of that goes to the fact that I'm definitely afraid of it. I'm definitely afraid of standing up here in front of you right now as well. But uh, you know, at that point in time in my life, I didn't create music for anyone else. I was doing it for myself. I was doing it for my friends, and. The like five girlfriends that I ex girlfriends that I wrote music about at that point in time, I guess you know. But um, if you you have so many people out there who are going to support you, your friends, your family, and then all these people that you're going to be able to find, um, you don't have time for these people. Don't worry about that. Um, I can say anyone from my friends who are still in bands all the way up to the largest brands that I've ever worked with uh, around the world. There are always people who are not going to like what you're doing or always people are going to think they know how to do it better. And if you can just tell those people to piss off and, uh, and focus on you and focus on and getting your message out there, uh, that, that's all the better. So that's, that's all I've got for you guys right now. Um, definitely, uh, if you have any questions, if you don't want to ask them now, get that. Uh, always feel free to at me on Twitter. Or uh, my, my email will probably be up on the site. I would guess uh, Tommy would put it up there. Um, but th this world of, of influence, and especially the digital age, just keeps evolving. And um, you know, I, I really just kind of push you guys to, to think about how you can further yourselves in, in terms of a brand or in terms of this idea of being a business and, and push yourselves out there. And uh, good luck to all of you. Thanks for coming. All right, uh, the 
any questions? So, yeah, whatever you have to say, you have to say it now, so we can start the discussion with a, with a brilliant gentleman. Hi, thanks a lot for this. Uh, my question is, it's a kind of a hypothetical one, but uh, do you think, uh, especially like, because again, as it was said before, we've got kind of the like capacity to have access to a fan base and be in control of what we do and what we decide to put out. You know, obviously the more we do it, there might be patterns emerging in a sense of what kind of people you tend to appeal on and what kind of age range, you know what I mean? So do you think that might kind of uh, affect the way artists Writing music in a sense, like what they choose, how they choose to write, and why they choose to write about, because they get that certain amount of feedback on on their social kind of media and stuff. I think it might, but at the end of the day, like I think you have to be true to yourself in, in what you're doing, right? Like uh, when I write music, when my friends write music, you write music that comes from inside you, and, and if other people don't like that. You know, if your goal is to sell a million gold records, then that really shouldn't matter to you, I think. But, you know, I, I, I don't think that taking constructive criticism from anyone is bad or taking direction. Um, you know, I can say my, my friend's band's in Seattle, right? Like, I said they had a bunch of 15 year old girls at their concerts, and it's totally true. If you see, like, the progression of their music from, I would say, like, 2009, when they used to be called Most Versatile Boy, to, uh, which was named after an old trophy that they had, um, to, you know, 2011 when they were uh, Sunderland, which is a softer name, they, they also had a softer sound, and then, you know, it, it definitely appealed to their audience a little bit more because I think they'd like to have the girls screaming at them at the end of the day. But, you know, I, whether I could say, you know, I, I, don't, I, I think you could ask 20 people here, they might have different questions or different answers to that. But I don't think it's bad to be able to use social, use digital to be able to get feedback on, on your shows or anything like that. Hi, um, thanks for that one, I really enjoyed it. Um, my question was about your influence pyramid. Um, and I was just wondering, you were saying about flipping it on its head. Um, does that mean, um, when you're starting out, you encouraging um, emerging artists just to try and get their fans excited to get it to bloggers, or do you think contacting um, bloggers is a good thing to do? So I would say, like, you definitely want to start with your friends and family. Like, the more kind of momentum you have behind you, the more you're able to, like, I guess my thing is, so, I don't know who that was. Anyway, uh, you know, if you have your friends and your family behind you, you have your, like, strong, hardcore fans behind you at the beginning. Um, when you actually start to reach out to bloggers and stuff like that, you have a little bit more kind of social capital behind you, right? Um, all of a sudden when they throw your name into Google and they don't know who you are, they're gonna see that there are other people talking about you and that sort of stuff. So that's why, that's why I kind of talk about this idea of flipping it on its head. Um, I definitely think that's important as well, you know, um, as you start to grow and as you start to, uh, you know, have more things to say and more things to share, I, I think reaching out to those kind of mid-tier bloggers is definitely something you can do. And, and again, probably don't have to employ someone to do that for you at the beginning. Um, all my girlfriends would get mad at me for saying that, but you, you really don't. At, at the end of the day, like, you're, you're the artist, you're your you're music, uh, and you're going to be able to better tell that story, whether it's or whether it's just going to just walking down the street. I'm going to ask you about grunge music. I'm from Seattle. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. That was before my time, actually. Okay, I have a question. So this is what I'm thinking about all the time. Basically, this is what I wanted you to answer to me, and this is why I got you here. So you gotta answer. So it's all about connecting the dots, okay? So you start, first of all, leveraging your own influence. You influence the people that are passionate about what you do. Then maybe through this influence, you try to reach more high-profile bloggers, and then you go to the end of the pyramid. How do you spot who you're contacting next? And how do you do this? <coughs> so I work in the digital space, so I always, I always think digitally. Um, the internet is a great wealth of information. A lot of times you can actually get lost in a lot of it, but um, one of the great things, I, I'm surprised I, I forgot to touch on it, but it was actually connecting with other artists um, and connecting with other bands and stuff like that, because at the end of the day, like, those people are going to be able to help open doors for you as well. Um, there are a lot of great artists who may be a couple steps ahead of you in, the, in their progress and in, in their history, 
and those people are always willing to help out. Um, not, I'm not going to say all this, but a lot of those artists are willing to help people out because they came up the same way uh, that other artists do. And so being able to use those people to find those connections uh, to then also, you know, like I said, using digital, being able to find out what blogs people are reading, uh, that sort of stuff. If you want to get really black hat about it, you can, you know, when you actually start finding the people who are talking about you, uh, you can go look on their profile, find out who they're following. That's a good indication of maybe what publications they're reading, what sites they're visiting, that sort of stuff as well. So then you know that that's kind of your next step uh, after you get these people behind you. Okay, so it does make sense. The way that I'm trying to work things out is first of all, see who I want to reach out to. Then I, I try to think whether this is realistic or not. If it's not, I'm good at judging this. Sometimes I get rejected, but most of the times they say, all right, you know, because I'm always quite realistic. And then I try to find somebody who they might know or they're connected with, and then somebody this person is connected with that I can reach out to, depending how easy it is. And, and this is the way that I'm working out. If I see something is missing, I'm trying to build this. So I can be able to give something to that, to that person and then reach out to the other person. And I don't know whether you agree with this or... No, I, mean, I definitely agree with it. I think there needs to be kind of like a more cemented version of, um, you want to call it LinkedIn for artists, right? Like it, it's this idea about connecting people with other people. There's bits, bits and pieces of it on things like Pure Volume, SoundCloud, stuff like that, but you know, it's not quite connected up to maybe that next level where it sees people that they need to be talking with to get information out there. Um, so if you want to build that, go ahead. I, I get half though. <laughs> People furthest from him always raise their hand. Hi. My question basically is about um, the EU. I mean, you come from um, America and for for a local artist from the UK who wants to actually reach out to say, you know, other countries in Europe or the US um, through social networking, obviously um, we're here and they're over there, we're not going there right now. What do you think the best way to actually influence another country from here? I think maybe the best way would actually be to start reaching out through similar artists to yourselves, you know, start connecting with those people. Someone earlier talked about collaboration, uh, doing that sort of stuff. Who was that that said that? That was a great idea. Bonus points for you. Um, you know, that's a great way to do it, actually. Um, and then you kind of keep your name up there a little bit. You're able to use those people, maybe crash on their couch the first time you go over to the States, right? Making those connections with people, I think, is really important. Uh, I was talking to, I believe they left two, uh, two ladies earlier, actually, about um, some of their videos are doing really well in Germany. And it's something you can tell on YouTube, right? You can see where the videos are uh, geographically. Some of their videos are doing really well in Germany, and they're trying to think, how do we make that leap? How do we get over there? How do we actually get over there, meet these people, get some gigs going, actually get paid for going over there at the same time? Um, you know, so, so I think the, the chances are definitely there. And I think it all starts again with the relationships. Um, and I think probably artist to artist is probably one of the easier ways to do that at the beginning. Thank you. Here's the microphone. Are there any questions? Yes. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, one other thing I was going to say, um, since I am new to London, I have not gotten into the local music scene that much at all. So if you guys want to send me any of the tracks or anything, do it on Twitter. I'll definitely give it a listen. And uh, I look forward to getting more into the London music scene. So. Cool. Thanks, guys. So basically some people know what this is all about, some people is the first time. My vision for Dark Music Talks is over time to create the biggest e-library of knowledge, of free knowledge for people to just find social, find social media, social influence, social this and that, or whatever they might need. So attending to those things is going to be part of a bigger vision. I'm not going to stop. I want this thing to evolve through you. So, however you might want to help, the easiest way is to tell a friend. And the next one is going to be in a month. You will receive an email. 
and we'll start from there. So thank you very much for being here. I'm Tommy.